Hello, brothers and sisters. I'm the Treetop Flyer, and we are the Altai Band. And today, we're going to bring to you the first in our series of living permaculture. Now, a little earlier at the turn of the year, uh, we created a documentary that was uh, entitled Agenda 21. And in Agenda 21, uh, which stands for United Nations Agenda for the 21st Century, we outlined uh, many uh, of the situations that are happening today where they're attempting to force upon us uh, a sustainability that is a bit artificial based on uh, all the crises that are happening around the world. Uh, population problems, climate, global warming, all these resource issues. So in that documentary, we outlined some of the problems we're facing. In our Living Permaculture series, what we want to do is bring you solutions. Because it doesn't do much good to present the problems without offering the solutions. So that is what our Living Permaculture series is going to be about. Some of them we'll be able to do inside in the studio here. Others will be in the field and out in nature. Today, what we want to bring to you is something very ancient, very basic, very essential, and a wonderful spiritual art as well. We're going to teach you or share with you how to make living, sprouted bread. You can't get more basic, fundamental, and essential than that. Now, when I originally began making sprouted living bread de many decades ago, it's the kind of bread I've eaten all my life and made all my life, uh, I learned it to be called a scene bread. Now, have you, if you've never heard of that term, the Essenes were a brotherhood uh, in the Middle East, uh, the Holy Land. Uh, it was an ancient uh, mystical brotherhood that the actual historical Yeshua ben Joseph and his father Joseph uh, were a part of. They were a, a fascinating uh, ancient brotherhood. And this is the type of bread in the ancient Middle East that they made, that they baked, that they lived on, and it was actually a requirement in their health-keeping laws to have sprouted living bread. Now, there's many, many, you know, unlimited types of bread a person can make, but today we're going to focus on sprouted living bread, and what that means is you're taking these wonderful, essential cereal grains, which are quite a marvel in themselves. All the mystery of the world right there in that little, tiny, nutrition-packed miracle. Everything it needs to reproduce itself for countless generations, genetically, and nutritionally is right there in that seed. But when you soak it in water and sprout it, as would happen naturally if you planted the seed in the ground to grow a crop, a marvelous transformation occurs. The water opens up the life force in the seed, and a marvelous uh, enzyme and chemical reaction begins to take place which gives you a much more enhanced nutrition because you're getting all the benefits of the plant as well as the benefits of the seed itself. And now you get them combined. So when you make a living sprouted type bread, you're maximizing the living nutrition you can get from that bread. It's also, as far as I'm concerned, 
among the most simple, <laughs> basic type of breads to make because it's uh, fundamentally a very simple process. It requires uh, very low heat. You do not uh, bake these breads with um, the high heat in an oven that you do some of the other types of breads. And there's no yeast added to make the breads rise. It's not a, a, a rising bread. It's simply sprouted. And the other wonderful thing about it is you can add anything you want to it. There are basically kind of two different uh, directions you can go. You can go for a sweeter, like a breakfast type bread, and add things that give it a little uh, more sweetness in its, in its flavor, like um, dates and figs and carrots and honey and nuts of various types. Or you can go toward more of a, of a meal bread that is just basically your sprouted grains. And you can shred vegetables and, and put that in as well. And you can uh, even put meat in this bread and take it more in the direction of a meatloaf, like a traditional meatloaf. And the fun thing is, is you can experiment with all those possibilities. So, um, as I said, it's a, it's a very simple bread to, to make. I've taught people how to do this in my wilderness survival classes and uh, as a preparedness consultant in preparedness type classes. I have baked this on hot rocks around the campfire. Uh, you can bake this type of bread in those solar uh, ovens that you see are, are sold today for people to be able to cook in hot tropical environments when they don't have a lot of fuel available or uh, it's expensive for them, third world countries and things like this. You do not want to take this bread above 135 degree temperature in its uh, baking process. So it can be done even in the hot desert sun with some hot rocks or a reflector. It's a very simple, low tech, low heat type of bread to make. And uh, I've baked it all my life in a Dutch oven, which we'll show you a little later, uh, on top of the wood-burning uh, heating stove. You make it up, put it in the Dutch oven, put your wood in the stove, damp it down a little bit, go to bed, sleep, wake up in the morning with fresh Essene bread. It's a wonderful thing to do. It only takes uh, two and a half, three hours. And, uh, It's ancient, ancient health keeping type of bread. So let's talk a little bit about sprouting seeds, how you do it. The first thing you want to do is you want to take your whole grain. And the other wonderful thing about this type of bread is you can combine grains. And I recommend you do combine grains because then you get even a more complete nutritional profile. Uh, whole wheat, for instance, um, has a wonderful balance of nutrients, but it doesn't have all of the amino acids. When you add in amaranth and quinoa or chia seeds and things of that nature, you complete the amino acid profile and get complete protein nutrition. I would recommend that you do whole grain, hard red wheat as the basic uh, grain and add a little bit of the other grains into the process uh, to combine it. And you can experiment uh, and get different flavors and different textures. Sprouted living Essene bread like this is a moist, chewy bread. It, it's a little more almost like, uh, like cake-like. It's chewy. And, and, and that reason, the reason is because it's sprouted and it, uh, the, the gluten uh, keeps its uh, moist, chewy texture. It's not a dry bread, and it's not just filled with uh, air because it's not rising uh, with the yeast. So the first thing you want to do with whatever grains you're going to use is you rinse them. 
And what I like to do is uh, use a large uh, glass jar or a bowl, and you put your grain in it, and you rinse them with water. Now, it's very important. I really want to stress to you that you do not use city water in this process. There's no reason to go to the effort of sprouting seeds to get a healthy living bread and then use water that has chlorine and fluoride and lots of other things in it. What you want is the purest, best living water you can get your hands on from an artesian well, a deep well, or better yet, a spring, a natural spring, if you can get natural spring water. That's kind of keeping in the, in the, the purpose of the whole, the whole uh, thing that we're doing here. So you rinse the seeds at least twice. Put the water in, swish it around, dump it out through a sieve so the grain doesn't spill like this, a sieve of some sort, a strainer. And you do that twice. And then you're going to take your jar and you're going to put your grain in. And you're going to fill it up with water so the water comes to the top. And then you're going to let it soak at least a half a day or overnight. Now, when you um, soak the grain, the seeds begin to swell, they begin to soften, and the transformation of the sprouting transformation begins to happen. It will give off a wonderful byproduct, that water from when you've allowed it to soak for a period of time becomes um, filled with enzymes and it, it's, it's a very good food for your digestive system uh, along with the probiotic. It, the probiotic in your, in your uh, GI tract feeds on this as a food and it's very good for a healthy um, digestive system. Now, one of the other things I wanted to mention is today I see this uh, craze about uh, non-gluten recipes. Uh, no gluten, no gluten in the bread, no gluten in the pizza dough. No, uh, people uh, seem to be having a, a great difficulty with the gluten in whole wheat. Now, I think it's worth asking um, why that would be. Wheat is known as the staff of life. It's um, been around for hundreds of thousands of years and it's fed human beings and nourished them and provided for them to live for countless thousands of years. Why would now people be unable to digest and assimilate whole wheat? What's happening? Well, I think that it has to do with our digestive systems are being weakened from a variety of factors, and our immune systems are being weakened from a variety of factors, and that's part of what introducing this living sprouted bread is all about, to help bring back health. <laughs> um, many people are very sensitive to yeast, and you don't put yeast in this type of bread baking. So that's what we're after, a living, sprouted, superior nutrition type of bread. Uh, this comes from the ancient Middle East, as I said, throughout the ancient Middle East. Uh, wheat was grown other places as well, the ancient varieties of, of wheat. And if you go to um, a health food store or a co-op or a place to buy whole grain, organic grain, that's also what I would like to encourage, that you do that. I would also highly recommend that uh, if you're excited about breaking, baking your own bread, that you secure a good long-term storage supply of whole grains. I'm a preparedness consultant, I'm a survival skills instructor, so of course I'm going to throw in my suggestion that you do that. I think it would be very wise to do so. Okay, now with that introduction, I'm going to introduce to you my beloved bread baking partner, Galia Wind.
Just what everybody wants in a bread baking partner, right there. We figured we'd throw in as much Middle Eastern flavor as we could in this process. Here you see she has just brought in a large glass jar of grain, a combination of whole wheat, and I believe we have quinoa in this one, and it has been rinsed and soaked as I spoke about a moment ago. So it's ready to do the next step. Now, having told you about that wonderful substance that comes off of the soaking process, we brought some here. She's gonna keep bringing the ingredients in. This is the water that came from the soaking process. It's actually called Rejuvelac. It's a wonderfully invigorating, health-promoting substance. Would you like to have some, my love? Here. I love this stuff. And it, it's quite tasty, too. So this is the Rejuvelac. This is the water we've poured off after leaving it soaking overnight or half a day. You don't want to leave it too long. If you leave your grain soaking too long, it can start to ferment and basically almost rot. Now, when you, I want some of that. I'm thirsty. Once you um, soak the grain, you put it in a clear glass wide mouth jar like this, if you can find them, it's not easy anymore, and place it in the sun or at least a warm spot. If you have grow lights, you can use grow lights instead of the sun because a lot of times in the winter here, we don't see the sun for a long time. The sunlight, of course, will help the sprouting process. Now, this is a traditional cast iron Dutch oven. My favorite piece of cookware by far, good old fashioned pioneer cast iron cookware. This is all you need to bake this bread and a source of heat. You can use a casserole dish, a ceramic casserole dish, if you don't have one of these. But I would also highly recommend everybody acquire a Dutch oven, and they come in various sizes. They're all over the antique stores and flea markets and garage sales and stuff because people don't seem to value them anymore, but I can bake this bread in a Dutch oven on coals from a campfire, on top of the wood-burning heat stove. You can bake this type of bread in your backyard barbecue on charcoal briquettes like you would a summer barbecue. If you have propane, that's fine. Do it on your backyard barbecue with propane, but you don't want to use flame a flame source of heat when you bake this bread because you'll burn the bottom. And Gallia Wind here is going to demonstrate all the rest of the process. And here is a finished loaf of bread that was baked just this morning by my beloved here. And when we're finished, we're gonna share it with everybody and eat it. This is what you end up with. You see, it's not a, a thick, puffed up, rising loaf. It's denser than that type of bread, but it's still moist and kind of chewy. Okay, now we're going to begin to demonstrate the process of how you actually make this type of bread. To make this type of bread, 
you have to mash and pulverize the soaked softened grain into a moist glutinous jello like mass that's the key and you actually have to break apart the grains and mix it all together now we have a wonderful device that we've brought here that we use in baking our own making our own bread it's called a squeezo strainer but it's basically very much like an old-fashioned traditional meat grinder an extruding screw that goes through the center with a die in the front and as you put the wheat down in there and turn the handle it forces it through the screw and it's extruded and pressed out through the die in the front that has small holes in it very much like a traditional meat grinder I highly recommend you have your own traditional meat grinder and look for these you can buy these new or you can find them used as well but it was actually called a squeezo strainer food processor we do vegetables with it you can do tomatoes with it you can make purees with it but it's the best device for making a lot of this soaked grain into the kind of loaf that you make when you do sprouted living bread now in ancient times of course they didn't have that in ancient times it was done usually in a large wooden trough a large bread bowl sometimes ceramic hollowed out log a bowl and they would generally use a masher like a club or a uh, like when you have a mortar and pestle kind of process and they would knead and mash and use their hands and just keep working it and working it and working it or smash it and work it and mix it all together and we'll show you how to do that both ways with the squeezo strainer as well as a traditional um, mashing kind of process so would you like to begin my love yes of course my love we start to put this green I taught her how to do this about four and a half five years ago and she's become the absolute <laughs> master of baking and making Essene bread of many many different Generally, types Generally, I put this beautiful green so you dump your soaked grain into a strainer or a sieve so the last little bit of moisture yes. and water can drain out and now we can start this ancient ancient process you load it into the squeezo strainer and sometimes they have an additional kind of cup top so you can hold more and very simple movements is it tight enough yeah now this front of this has a tensioning mechanism that you can tighten and you don't want it too tight because then that makes the grinding process harder by the way this is like how to save money on your fee for your gym workout routine <laughs> you just do stuff like this yeah, and bake you your own bread and then you don't have to do so many lift so many weights because it's work so you may make sure that you don't have the tensioning uh, screw too tight and not too loose if it's too loose you won't be mashing and breaking the grains apart as they need to be and creating this gelatinous glutinous kind of uh, mush <laughs> so you can do it with one hand to develop your muscles on the right hand and it's sometimes nice if you have with your other hand something to kind of keep packing do it with other hand see this is why you do this as a team see is a this is like tandem team bread making anyway you push on it to help hold the grain down onto that screw so that the screw is grabbing it and forcing it through the die and creating the stuff that you want so you see what 
happening this we want the temptation is to want to eat it like it is but you see what you have now that's what gluten is it's a protein and it's sticky like so and what you're doing is you want to make sure I think you need to tighten the thing a little bit more because you're getting a little bit too much grain if you get too much of the whole grain whole and everything in it without being mushed and ground and squished you can do it twice you can run this stuff back through there twice otherwise keep packing enough grain into the top that it does a good job it's good you, to eat this way too <laughs> uh, you can exercise your belly dance as well yeah you can put on the, put the headphones on turn on the music and dance while you're doing it that's what she does yeah <laughs> always women <clears throat> the idea is make it fun make it an art now fun and healthy and what and healthy yeah it's a good exercise we grind all our own grains when we're going to turn them into flour for other types of baking and cooking and we do this to bake all our own bread we don't buy bread this is the kind of bread we eat all the time and frankly, after having heard delicious varieties of Essing bread, I don't really care to eat any other kind of bread. You will notice a difference if you eat this kind of bread regularly. It's like a meditation as well. Women never have time for themselves. So you can use this time one hour generally i do in one hour 45 minutes to an hour is how long it takes her generally to process um, a loaf of this size sometimes she'll make two a loaf this size two of us eat in two and a half to three days this kind of bread is much more filling than the other types of bread with yeast that rise because they're mostly air filled with air pockets this bread is very dense very solid and packed with all the other kinds of things that you can put in it as we talked about this particular one has squash yes anything else not this time, this time. I put only squash. squash so we have whole wheat millet. quinoa no millet millet was the other grain we put in this one any uh, uh, quinoa on this one no, not this no one. Quinoa on no quinoa. No. And um, cinnamon. Cinnamon. You can spice it however you want. Sometimes we use a little nutmeg. Sometimes we use a little cinnamon. Sometimes you can put a little honey on it if you want it a little sweet. Or but it's actually olives. Olives. You can go the vegetable route. Olives and occasionally potatoes. You can shred potatoes. All right. Now while she's grinding that, I'm going to show you. If you'll hand me that bowl, my love. The bowl. The wood bowl. If you didn't have a squeezo strainer or a meat grinder, you would put it in a bowl like this and just take a, a standard uh, potato masher and start mashing like so. Now this is a lot more work for sure. That's why we do it this way. But you just keep mashing and kneading and mashing and kneading and you'll get there I think in the ancient times they probably did it in a big wood uh, kind of tray and really mashed on it with something powerful but you'll see the, doing? the glutinous white inside of the softened grain will start to come out maybe you should uh, show and you can see it right there you see how it's starting to do that and get some different camera shots I'm doing, it right there. I'm doing better. How about right there? Huh? I'm doing better. Oh yeah, you're definitely doing better because you got the speedy tool. So this is how you do it. Do you think, uh, what about electrical squeezer? I d I've never seen one. I'm sure they're out there that you can buy things like this that uh, are electric, but what we want to show you is simple 
primitive type technology living that's actually um, don't depend on electricity doesn't depend on electricity doesn't depend on a higher energy use doesn't depend on a lot of sophisticated type uh, equipment this is as ancient simple and basic as you can get good time for meditation and um, connection with our ancestors that's a good idea I like that <laughs> I baked bread this way for an entire decade when I lived in the wilderness in the Olympics and I had no electricity at all so I did it all by hand like this and practice the belly dance because it's it is me. Wow, you are doing good. See, it works. You just got to keep at it. So you just keep mashing it and kneading it. Now, when you get a whole bunch of it like that, you roll your shirt sleeves up and you take your hands and you work it with your hands and you just keep working it and working it. The key is it's got to be turned into this kind of a glutinous dough like. Good. I love it just like that. Yeah. And Raw, with, still you it. know, with honey, it's absolutely. You can do that too. Raisins, dates, figs, nuts, seeds of all sort, combinations of grains, squash, vegetable, apples. We we put apples in it often. Mm -hmm. All of these things can be added into it, and you can experiment and come up with all kinds of wonderful flavor combinations. So. I think that should be um, where we pause for the next step. You want to help me, Myla? Of course. Please. Now, this is like tag team, tandem work. She does it for a while, and then I do it for a while. I like to fill this thing. And I like to do it with two hands, force the grain down in there. And crank away. See how that stuff's coming out right there? You see it's forcing it, it's being forced through the dye and it comes out like strings and it's just filling up in the bowl and then eventually she'll show you the next step of it after we do this and get all this grain done this way. Okay. All right, now the sprouted grain has been processed through the squeezo strainer. It's a nice glutinous mass, and she will now begin the next steps of forming the loaf. You see there, it's all in the bowl, and it's all been processed through the squeezo strainer. So we don't need this. Want to hand me the squash? This. I'll shred the squash that we're going to add. This could be potatoes, it could be squash, it could be carrots, it could be apples, it could be anything you want to put in there. And this adds a whole different dimension to the bread. My love, please hand me the cinnamon. Cinnamon, uh, salt. And oil. We don't need oil. Oil. Salt. Salt. Okay, now we start to mash. Don't do that. <laughs> A little improvisation. This is a wonderful project and process to teach your children. Children of any age can do this, and it's a lot of fun. A little oil. And they'll be so proud of themselves at having made their own delicious sprouted living bread. Do you want to say something about salt? Yes. The salt is an essential part 
and we use what's called real salt. It's brownish, tan in color, and it has the dark specks of the, of the full mineral salt. It comes from deep mine deposits, deep uh, ancient salt deposits mined deep within the earth. And that's the kind of salt I would recommend. It's not a good idea to use the white processed iodized salt for this type of bread. Of course, along the Dead Sea and in the Middle East, they use those salts that they got from the Dead Sea. Because the Essene, the Essene community was right along the shores of the Dead Sea. This is enough. And here we have shredded homegrown, was this a butternut squash? Yes. Homegrown butternut squash Can I put it here? from our garden. And now you apply that a little bit at a time. What a smell you feel. Into the loaf. And you see how she's kneading it with her hands? That's the fun part. The kids just love it. And you work it, and you work it, and you work it, and you squish it together, and you add your other ingredients in little by little. It's fun to work as a team. As a team. This, this is like relationship team building. <laughs> <laughs> Try it. You'll like it. You will, <clears throat> you will resolve all family problems. Just be careful if she decides to throw it at you, and then you know you messed up. <laughs> In our case, never happened. Never happened. Good. Okay. okay. And you can take your loaf, as she shows you how to uh, form the loaf, you can be artistic and creative, and I recommend you do that. You can make it into shapes. This is fun for the children, too, if you teach your children. Make it into shapes. Put some artistry into it. You know, the way I look at it is that enlightened people pursue truth and knowledge and artistry in everything that they do. And that's a hallmark of what I would consider enlightened people. And that's what we try to do with everything. Make it a process that you enjoy. Put your mind and your heart into it and uh, be creative. Then it doesn't seem like work. It's, it's, it's fun. It's enjoyable. Yes. She's absolutely the master of Essing <laughs> bread now. Her, her bread is the best I've ever had anywhere. <laughs> I'm glad you appreciate it. I do. And we actually cook ours on an outdoor stove, wood heating stove. I built a special little building, and uh, the wood stove is out there. And uh, because you don't always want to create that heat in your indoor environment, if you, if you need to, you can do it on that stove. But sometimes you don't want to create that heat, like in the summer when it's very warm. We bake this kind of bread year round. So we have an outdoor stove, and we do it on that. Okay, now it's already. You see, she's forming the loaf, wrapping all the ingredients all together, forming the loaf. With, and, the, with the flour. And then she took the flour. So sticky. And she puts it around the outside. And you want to put a nice little coating of flour on the bottom. And if you're using a Dutch oven or a, a ceramic well, we casserole. We can show it. Uh, you can take the. If you're that using. Loaf a uh, Dutch oven or a ceramic casserole dish, you must oil the inside of it very well. Please Put a nice it. coating of oil, and that helps keep it from sticking. That's really important because the bottom will occasionally stick. And what we do if we're cooking it on the wood heat stove that we are using for heat at that time, um, the top of the stove can get a little bit too hot and it might burn the bottom of your loaf. So we take an extra little, like a, 
a metal cookie tray, like you bake cookies or muffins on them. And we place that on top of the wood-burning stove so there's that extra little space and extra metal, and that keeps the bottom of the cast iron from getting so hot that it uh, can burn mm. the bottom of your bread. It's not going to hurt it, but uh, it's just better to not burn the bottom of the bread. So there you are. Now okay. we've oiled the base. You notice she formed it into a, a rather compact type of loaf, as you can see there, because in the baking process, it will collapse a little and settle and spread out. So if you spread it out too much to begin with, it'll collapse a little thin and be a little harder in its texture. This type of bread should be moist, chewy, and soft. It doesn't, you don't want it hard. Okay. Okay. Now. Now what? <clears throat> uh, did you put oil on the loaf yes, itself? Yes, of course. Okay. She put a coating, a light little coating of oil on the top of the loaf as well. And now you're ready to break, bake. So we generally fire up so. the stove ahead of time so that the stove is warm. Now, let me talk a little bit more about Dutch ovens. They are so wonderful. There are different types. This type does not have the rim on the top. There are Dutch ovens that have a cast iron rim around the top. And those are actually designed for old-fashioned pioneer cowboy cooking, where you literally take the coals out of the fire, and you can pile the coals on top in, inside the rim, and you've got heat coming down from the top, as well as coals underneath, or hot rocks, or however you're going to do it. And then it's a very efficient cooking all the way through. We love to take this, and you can put your, your meat in there, and your vegetables, and your grain, and all everything together, and slow, low temperature cook it over a long period of time. I, I absolutely, the more I've done that over the years, find that is the most um, enjoyable type of cooking, and it preserves more uh, nutrition in the food to not take the heat very high in, in temperature. That so destroys a lot of uh, important things. Let's remind how, uh, how m many ingredients we need to cook. So give the list of ingredients. She's going to tell you the list of the ingredients. So we take... Um, Whole grains, whatever combination you want. Four cups. Four, four cups of this. whole grain. No, three cups of whole grain and one cup of millet or amaranth or quinoa. Okay, so what she meant was three cups of just the wheat and one cup of an additional grain to add to it. It's still the grain, but uh, an additional grain to go with the wheat was the combination we used. A pinch of salt. Yeah, uh, soak for three or four days. Soaking for three or four days. I changed the water twice in the morning in the evening. Twice a day, for however many days you soak, change in the morning and the night. Then you won't get any sort of a fermented, stale taste to it, and that's very important. You want to keep the water fresh. And then again, you pour off this wonderful liquid called rejuvelac, which I want some more of. How about you? You want some more of that? Mm -hmm. I do. It's good stuff. You feel regenerated immediately. It's good. You really notice it rich in enzymes and vitamins. It's good stuff. The water has to be clean. Clear, natural water. spring water, if you can get it. And then you mash. Process it through the squeeze strainer or meat grinder or by hand. Add everything you want. Put your additional ingredients in and um, form the loaf. Form the loaf. I put it on the slow fire. Slow, low temperature. Here's the critical thing. Do not exceed 135 degrees. Keep it 135 degrees or lower. If you go lower, it just takes a little bit longer. You don't want to dry it out. It should be moist. And if you've soaked the grain enough, there's plenty of moisture in there that it will stay moist if you don't get that temperature up too high. And I believe that wraps it all up. Yes. Good job. So, again, no. I'm the Treetop Flyer. This is Gallia Wind. We are the Altai Band. And we hope you enjoy baking 
your own living sprouted bread. Again, we want to give you a little Middle Eastern flavor for this type of Middle Eastern ancient living sprouted bread.